Hey everyone, I was just in the print farm here doing a changeover, and I realized I've been remiss. We've been in this facility now since June of last year, pushing a year now, and I have yet to really do any kind of update on what's going on. So I thought this would be a great opportunity uh, tonight to do kind of a state of the print farm. Uh, just a small subset of what we got going on in the shop. We've got laser cutting and all the uh, assembly and inventory and stuff too. I uh, hope to get to that in a future episode, but I just want to give you guys a quick look at where we are with the print farm because I do get a lot of questions from you guys, and uh, I think this could be a good opportunity for me to kind of point out a couple of things that have worked from a, for us. Uh, by no means is this the perfect solution. We are still constantly changing things around and learning and, and all that stuff, so uh, I always welcome any commentary you guys have, any suggestions. Uh, on how to improve it. If you're interested in print farming though, maybe you'll see some tips here that might be helpful for you. So to start out, uh, I got a bunch of this racking, uh, very commonly found at Home Depot uh, or Lowe's or Costco. And I love this stuff because it is heavy duty, but it is uh, modular and easy enough to take apart and um, move it around when inevitably we will decide that we want to move something somewhere else. So uh, we have it in use here for our, our racking. It's great. We can fit uh, four you know, to a shelf on the narrower ones. And uh, they, they actually do come in different widths and stuff like that. But basically, I have them set up into three different bays. Uh, over here, we got Michael Bay. We got San Francisco Bay. And on the far end, we got Salt Bay. And uh, I've kind of separated them out by... Um, nozzle and print configuration so right now like these are our 0.4 nozzles and then I've got 0.6s installed over here uh, we've done 0.8 as well nozzle swapping is uh, time consuming and so you know we try to strategically uh, assign printers based on what what the need is uh, currently we we are running parts for other companies as well as what we need uh, for ourselves which has been great keeping the machines busy is a great way to uh, obviously have other income coming in and uh, keep the um, operators, you know, employed, which is great. Uh, we're actually running some uh, parts for, for 3D Chameleon, Bill Steele's team here. Uh, he has some validated uh, setups that he really likes uh, with the um, smooth sheet. And so we'll run smooth sheet and we run textured sheet as well, depending on uh, what the parts are. But um, smooth sheet with uh, hairspray uh, is Bill, one of Bill's favorite tried and true methods. It works a treat. We do a ton of pet G here. Uh, and wh whatever you do, do not print bare pet G on the PEI smooth sheet. Uh, you're just asking to tear up the sheet. It will weld itself. Uh, but if you add a little substrate, if you use something like a glue stick or a hairspray, uh, it does a great job of adhering and when it cools down, pops off nice and easy. So uh, two, two rows of that. We got eight machines dedicated to that stuff. I got my .6 nozzles going over here. We're doing some rep box parts right now. One of the things that we um, found early on to make things efficient while we're kidding is we will try to either run a complete set of parts on one tray so that you know when we're done and we pop these things off, we can just pop them off and put them in a bag. Or what we'll end up doing is we will uh, try to time our sheets to coincide with uh, our shifts so that we're, um, we're not doing like a fast print and then a slow print. Like you really want to try to minimize the amount of time you're having to cycle the prints whenever possible. Right. And so it's not always a luxury that we, we have, but it is, uh, it is very helpful uh, so that we can, you know, kind of optimize the amount of labor. We have limited amount of labor to uh, devote to it. Uh, and so we know that we can have the prints running. Another thing you'll see, another technique that we use is we'll use these little uh, runners to connect parts together so that uh, for small parts, obviously, we're not having to count out individual things. We know we have a complete set. Reminds you kind of those old... Um, airplane models or, or um, you know, glue together model sets where you'd kind of break off the little parts, kind of stole that idea from there. But that makes it really uh, nice. So, that, you know, come kidding time, um, you can see we can just grab, we know we have a complete set here, throw it in the bag. Uh, so you can see we kind of have our, our parts will come off and we'll run them through kind of quality control. Um, we have like a little workstation for doing some, some CAD and slicing and stuff in here. Uh, <laughs> The, the, the paver stones. I get asked about the paver stones all the time. 
Uh, you may have seen Stefan's uh, over on CBC and C channels a uh, bit about decoupling. That is not why we were actually using the paver stones, although it did um, it did spark some inspiration for why we wanted to use it. The reason we brought them in was because the decking that I put down for the shelf here, the plywood was like a little warped or, you know, the racking wasn't totally level. And so the print, the printers would kind of, we didn't have a good flat surface. They would kind of wobble. We'd get some ringing and some oscillations in the, in the prints. And so I just went down adding a little bit of mass, like kind of kept things from bouncing around. And it also created a flat surface. It also has the benefit of, I guess, being somewhat more uh, flame retardant, you know, than just like heaven forbid something happen and, you know, light the decking on fire. Uh, there's still a lot of improvement to, to happen there, I know. Uh, thankfully, we don't generally run without people in here, but, uh, um, you know, we're, we're always doing the best we can to be as safe and, and, and secure as possible. Um, each of the bays, electrically, is a 20-amp circuit. So uh, I've got basically... Uh, three 20 amp circuits with a isolator bar in here. And this is something that you probably wouldn't end up needing to do uh, if you're not running a ton of machines. We found very early on, we were getting weird ghost in the machine type problems where we would just get a random layer shift. It was not from crash detection. It was not due to any mechanical issues. We went through all the basic troubleshooting. Everything was lubed. The belts were tight the way they needed. We would just get these weird shifts and as it turned out, it was due to basically poor power uh, in here. We were we were getting power sags when uh, the compressor, the shop compressor, would kick on, and uh, it would do something. We don't know exactly what, uh, but it it would intermittently just cause printers to wake out. So these ISO bars are really nice because they isolate each of the printers from each other. And then in addition to that, we have power conditioners on each one of these as well, so that if the power does sag, this will compensate for that. And we have nice clean power going to all these. Obviously having lighting, good lighting in your shop is really uh, critical. Can't recommend that enough. Uh, another thing, always recommend having a clipboard so that you can log machines. Machines will break down. They do break down all the time. In fact, uh, I don't know what a good rule of thumb is, but I can tell you that of the uh, 30 that I've got, 24, we try to keep about 24 running at any given time, but usually we'll have at least two or three down that we're harvesting for parts or repairing or whatnot. Um, we have a ton of spare parts on hand uh, for that for that very reason. Uh, you know, downtime can be costly. It means, you know, we're not, we're not running. And so, you know, having a, a good good place to repair and just expect that that your machines will break down and and then they do need to be repaired so obviously having a log to keep track of of what's uh, acting up on you and to communicate between people that are operating uh hey you know i had an issue with uh star scream today where you know i i was getting max temper or, or whatever you know the issue might be um large or small print farm number one tip for you Get a dedicated vacuum and leave it by there or, or uh, create a vacuum system like I have. Uh, I've got basically a vac system upstairs that I've wired in right here. And I've always got a vacuum because I can't tell you how often you get all these little filament bits and stuff building up. And it's just so nice to be able to, to, to clean that stuff up. It will get really grody really quick uh, with all of the, the strings of of filament and stuff that'll build up. So vac system is really great. Uh, another another tip for you guys, uh, tether your common tools to the racking uh, because otherwise people are just gonna walk up, myself included, we'll just like walk off with tools, uh, flush cutters, nozzle cleaning kits, uh, common hex keys, Allen keys. Uh, we try to keep all those strapped and in place because inevitably, like I said, they will vanish otherwise. Ventilation, that's another big question I get. Um, like I said, we do a lot of PETG, which is actually really mild, uh, a, nice, uh, a nice material to print with. I find it to be less, you know, um, fume generating than anything else that we've run. We've run ASA, ABS, even PLA, I feel like, has a little bit more of a particulate thing. But uh, our ventilation system is pretty basic. Uh, up above, I've got a bunch of um, inline duct fans, low speed, 
The whole point is just to create a little bit of negative pressure. We're not trying to create a breeze through here. Absolutely not trying to create a breeze through here, but just something to keep the air flow moving so it doesn't stagnate in here. It's a, it's a lot of guess and check and balance, and it depends on how many printers are running, what material you're printing with and, and whatnot. And uh, I think there's a lot of room in, for improvement. We just kind of have some four inch ducting that kind of comes down. There's a kind of a collector up above and below. Uh, and then that, you know, kind of helps just keep, keep some airflow. But obviously, uh, when we have to enclose <laughs> with our handy dandy shower curtain enclosure system, patent pending, uh, Hey, it's not pretty, but this is how the sausage is made. It, it works. Uh, it's effective and, uh, you know, we're scrappy. We do the best we can with the budget we have available with the tools we have available to us. And sometimes, uh, we have rushed jobs and we've just had to run down to target and grab a bunch of shower curtains and wrap up a bunch, bunch of machines up. Uh, so we could get, you know, get the print done. Balancing temperature is a challenge. Uh, when all of these machines are running at once, it can easily get over 100 Fahrenheit, over 40 C in here. Uh, and so, uh, and, and of course, the, the heat from each of the machines can, can have an impact on the adjacent machine. And so it depends on what we're running but it's constantly uh, an interesting challenge to either keep the room cool enough or keep the room warm enough, depending on what time of year it is. We've uh, insulated the whole thing so that, you know, ideally we're not um, dealing with the outside temperature nearly as much, but uh, it, it is an ongoing uh, challenge for us. So it's something that I, I hope that we can continue to improve upon and I'll, I'll try to share more findings with you guys uh, as, as uh, time goes on. And this was actually our, our first attempt at the large spool racking system. Uh, basically, I just got a bunch of PVC tube and, and we, we kind of put our large spools up there and routed down. And you may have seen some, sh uh, some photos early on where I had kind of some PVC that would, would route down to the r lower rack. It worked and it, it was fine, but it was definitely a lot more tedious to swap those things out. Uh, that was where the idea for the turntable was born, and we, we kind of have our quick and dirty version of the turntable. This is what we're moving toward. It is uh, a lot easier to, to do swaps and stuff and just maintain a low, small footprint and a little bit of isolation and humidity control for the uh, spools of filament that we're doing. So that's, that's kind of uh, something we're, we're playing with um, right now. So, man, I know that's a lot. Uh, it has been... An amazing journey, uh, and I we you know have had such a great great time. I'm sure you're seeing a bunch of other stuff that I I probably haven't touched on. Maybe I can do more uh, of these if you guys like them in in the future. For now, let me know what you think. Uh, if you have questions, hit me up uh, in the in the chat or or on Twitter or whatnot. And uh, I hope I can kind of do the same process for our. Uh, other steps. So if you're interested in, in fabrication and, and using 3D printing uh, for your business and, and production, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping this can be of, of use to you guys. Uh, anyway, that's it. So state of, state of the print farm in, inside RepCord as of March 2021. Uh, and uh, I, I wish you guys all the best. Uh, have a good night. Talk to you soon. Bye.